Why don't I pray for us and we'll start our time. Lord, thanks this morning for your sovereign good care of the universe at the macro, at the micro, in the big picture with the final ending and all the details uh, down to the very details of our lives, uh, to the path of, of every electron and every orbit for all that is done in the outer reaches of space and down to the finest particles. You are in control. And we acknowledge, O oh God, that your control is good. Uh, help us as we oftentimes feel out of control to trust you. We ask that this morning would be a help uh, to that end for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Title for this morning's Equipping Our Message is Control. Have you ever felt out of control? Maybe you've been in a careening car that you were not driving. Do you know about the brake pedal on the passenger side? Have you used it? Did it work? Perhaps you have sometimes felt that life is like a car careening out of control. Maybe you're the central planner of your world and you need everything to be just so. The Academy Award winning animated movie, Lego Movie, it didn't really win Academy Awards, several years ago portrayed a dad who built with Legos this massive diorama and the kids were not allowed to play with it, to mess it up. And so he began super gluing all the pieces together so that nobody would mess with his stuff. Uh, that's the, the picture of a, a central planner, a, a controller who, who must have everything just so. And, and that kind of a person asks the question, why don't people just do what I want them to do? Maybe there are people under your authority. Maybe there are people who have authority over you. Uh, you may have peers, a spouse, politicians, your closest friends, your competitors who aren't doing what you want them to do. And you can find yourself being tempted to be a controller of people. You can also attempt to be a controller of circumstances. And this can manifest itself in being a people pleaser who wants peace all the time to worship at the altar of comfort and safety and ease. Those are the things we'll attempt to address this morning. The topic of control, that is a sinful desire to control circumstances or to control people. And my goal this morning is not to exhaust the topic. I'm not sure we could do that. But I want to make us aware of a subtle failure of faith to which most of us are prone from time to time and some are characterized by. I want to make us aware of this subtle failure of faith. A control is something of an umbrella term that we will use to describe a whole host of sinful behaviors stemming from wrong thinking. This is, in effect, the doctrine of the sovereignty of God applied at the heart level to the individual. This is a failure of theology, a failure of faith that we need to address this morning. Now, I want to give some caveats up front. I don't want to be misunderstood. As, as we talk about letting go a white-knuckle grip on control tendencies that are sinful, I don't want you to react, or I don't want us to think that laziness is the cure. A laissez-faire attitude or a lack of intentionality, you know, the, the kind of thing that says, aim at nothing, we'll hit it every time. Uh, without plans, a people perish. For lack of a vision, a people perish. In other words, if there are things that you're responsible for, be responsible. Don't neglect duty out of a fear of falling into the trap of sinful control that we'll talk about this morning. If you lead, lead with diligence. If you have rightful authority delegated by God, exercise that authority biblically, humbly, as a servant of those under your care, etc. There, there, there are lots of ways that you could overreact to what we'll talk about this morning in ways that would actually be sinful. So don't do any of those. Either the ones I listed or the ones I didn't, don't do them. As we're talking about sinful control this morning, we're talking fundamentally about a failure of faith. Faith particularly in the sovereign goodness of God and the outworking of His perfect plan. In that plan, we labor. 
We work. We work by faith. God uses means to accomplish His ends, and our diligent and faithful labors are His means. Sinful control is a practical atheism. A practical atheism that forgets God, takes matters into our own hands, and then glories in or complains about the outcomes. If I'm in charge, if I've super glued all the Legos together because I don't want other people messing with them, then I get glory for the buildings. And I get dismantled when the buildings fall down. There's a real test of the heart in in whether I've got a white knuckle grip on sinful control tendencies or whether I'm trusting the Lord, working hard and trusting Him for outcomes. And that is what your heart does when things don't work out. Am I complaining? Am I manipulating? Am I resorting to sinful control strategies to get it back into place? Or do I do what God would have me to do and trust Him for the outcomes? That's what we're aiming at this morning. I want at the front end to confess my sources to you. I am utterly dependent upon others for this material. And to put a number of biblical ideas and Christian growth categories under this one umbrella of control did not originate with me. I got that from Tom Angstead. Uh, Tom Angstead has counseled for decades from the material that I'm going to try to summarize with you this morning. And Tom was discipled by other biblical counselors who shared these truths with him. So I have watched Tom over 16 years in his discipleship and counsel and care of me and in his helping me counsel others. And I am grateful. So these are not my original ideas. These come, frankly, from Tom, from others, through Tom, to me, over a decade and a half. I want to give an illustration, and I want to take an illustration from the world of political ideology. And this is sort of a big picture illustration of control. And I'll borrow this illustration from communism, socialism, and Marxism. If you don't know what those are, um, they're bad words. You can leave it at that. Um, If this illustration is helpful, it's helpful. Uh, I'm giving you my shoot from the hip definitions of these. These are probably not technical definitions that Karl Marx or Joseph Stalin would agree with. Well, they might. Communism. Make everybody equal so that you can remove things like jealousy, conflict. You can have an absence of war and world peace if everybody has the same stuff. Wouldn't that be great if we all just shared it together? Um, don't mention that we'll be starving, miserable, lazy with no incentive for work or creativity, and you have to regularly take people out back and shoot them to keep everybody excited about the plan. The central planners, the ones in control, have constructed their idea of utopia to which everyone else is enslaved, and isn't it great? Socialism. Here's, Here's my shoot from the hip description of socialism. It is a path toward communist utopia. It can't quite admit it, but it wants to get you there by half measures. Central planners with all the control, who, by the way, live in lavish lifestyles with the freedom to do as they want, tell everyone else how to live. They create new categories of right and wrong, morality, immorality, good and evil that everybody else has to subscribe to. Like when Al Gore, who had the the fleet of Suburbans in his driveway, told everybody in Tennessee to ride a bike to work. When Al Gore, and I'm picking on him because I actually talked to him one time and I'm kind of, he was in our state and so you can feel a little personal animus here. Um, Al Gore had the largest electricity bill in the state and told everybody else to cut back on electricity. It's a, it's a hypocrisy by the central planners who have all the control, live how they want to live, and tell everybody else how to live. They enforce their plan by taxation, redistribution, and punishment. They promise to give you free stuff, but in the end, it's not the stuff you would choose. And they have to take your stuff away from you to give you the stuff they think you should have. That's socialism. And then Marxism, 
is, here, again, this is my shoot from the hip description, get everybody to hate each other. Dismantle the present structures of society, family, religion, civil politics, education, history. Do you understand how Marxists uh, eradicate history? They tell you, history begins now, make the world like we want. And they do all of that to, in addition to creating chaos in the streets and making life miserable until the population clamors for some really wise central planners who will bring peace and stability. They want control. Marx laid out a plan for how to get it. Destabilize the society, rewrite history, make people wish that you were in charge and take the reins. Now, few of us are Joseph Stalin. I hope none of us are Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin was the one who tried to practice this on a global scale in the 20th century. And he was responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of people. And he was personally responsible for a lifetime of misery for hundreds of millions more. The political ideologies of control are, are an illustration on a grand scale of the heart attitudes we're talking about this morning. But I want to zoom in on a much smaller world. Your world. Your sphere of influence. Your home. Your community. Personal relationships. Your sibling. A marriage. Maybe it's your sphere of influence in public. Maybe it's the sphere of influence behind closed doors that people don't see. I think that most of us humans naturally are controllers in one way or another. Characterized by sinful strategies for controlling our circumstances or controlling people around us. And apart from Christ, we use the means available to get what we want. Our loves drive our behaviors and our behaviors are attempts to secure what we love. And the center of all of it is self. This is the idolatry of self-love. But now, in Christ, the believer is not at the center. He has been rescued from that slavery to self-love. He's no longer held captive to the theology of from me and through me and to me are all things. To me be the glory forever. Amen. That's no longer the Christian's theology. God is on the throne. God is at the center. Jesus Christ has first place in everything. And the Christian life is a life of faith. Dependence upon God and selfless love. We do not see the need to control circumstances or people through illicit means. We trust God's good ordering of the events of our lives and we learn to distrust ourselves. That's a new Christian identity. That's a new Christian practice. And you're sitting here this morning, if you're a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, and, and you're growing in your sanctification and you're thinking, well, I'm not a slave of my sin. But my Christian life isn't what was just described either. What, what am I? You're a Christian uh, in a mixed condition. Not yet what you are, but not what you were either. On a path of growth. And it means you have new identity, new powers, indwelling Holy Spirit, a belief in, trust in, growing knowledge of the scriptures, the benefit of the church, sitting under the preaching of God's word. You have many resources at your disposal to relinquish sinful control tendencies and to be more like Christ as you grow. And you're on a path. You're on a path. You are on what we call, you are in what we call a mixed condition. There are new realities that you didn't have when you were not a Christian. And there are old tendencies that you did have when you were not a Christian. You bring those old tendencies as your residual depravity into this new life. And so there's a war. An internal war at the heart level before God that manifests itself in behaviors with others. So there is a question to answer here as we walk through this material this morning. A, a question about identity and standing is the question, am I characterized by these things, enslaved to these things? And the, the deduction you might come to is, am I even in Christ? Or are these tendencies in me in a way that need to be put to death increasingly as I grow closer to him? Let's talk about control of people first. Control of people. 
Control of people, I would describe, and I put this up on the screen for you, a manifestation of unbelief, of self-love, and pride, whereby I coerce other people to get what I want. Control of people is, hey, there's people, and they are means to an end. I want what I want. I can use the people to get it. And it flows out of unbelief, self-love, and pride. Let me give you some motivators for the control of people. Uh, listen, everybody's different. There is a lust for power and control in some human personalities and dispositions, sometimes as a result of nature or nurture. Some people want to be in charge of stuff and control stuff and be like the dad in the Lego movie that makes all the buildings go exactly like he wants. Not everybody's like that. Some of you can't understand the lust for power. Who would want to be in charge? I don't want to be in charge of anything. That doesn't take us out of the realm of controlling tendencies. It takes us out of the way they manifest themselves. But let's talk about motivators for control of people. You can be motivated by a desire that other people conform to me. And, and this can surface for any number of reasons. Uh, sometimes we want other people to do what we do, think what we think, live white like we live, to soothe our consciences. There may be a way that you're living that is displeasing to the Lord. But if I get my peers around me to do the same thing, it takes the sting of conscience away. So how can I coerce, control people to do what I'm doing to feel better about what I'm doing? Another aspect of that, I, I want to get people to conform to me to reinforce my self-righteousness. In other words, I'm pursuing a standard because I want to please the Lord or because I want other people to assume I'm pleasing the Lord. It can be internal or external. And so I want other people to conform externally to my self-prescribed standards of righteousness. I think... If someone's godly, they should tie their shoes left foot, then right foot. Because when I do that, I really think about glorifying the Lord. So I'm going to set that up as a, I just made a ridiculous example. I'm going to set that up as a standard, judge other people by whether they conform to that standard, and then give approval or disapproval to the people around me for conforming to my standard. I made it sound really silly, but I, I hope you see the tendency, either because I want to excuse my sin, get people to do what I do, or I want people to approve and agree with my self-righteousness, so get people to do what I'm doing. And, and, and this desire for control of people can look sinful externally or holy externally, and it is still an errant motivator. Another motivator for the control of people is the idolatry of a comfortable, easy life. Do you worship at that altar? I do sometimes. I don't like hard things. I don't want difficulty. I rebel under trials. I don't embrace what God has for me in a difficulty. How can I get this trial to go away? How can I make this discomfort go away? If I can use people to get comfort, I'm willing to do that if I'm a controller. Another motivator is pride. Uh, Romans 12, 3 says, No one should think more highly of himself than he ought. And so the, the controller has a high view of self. Um, I believe, like Marx or the Stalin or the central controllers of a, of, a, of a socialist political agenda, I know better how to live than other people, and so they should follow me. I have a high view of my opinions about life. And, and it's, it's great to have God's high view about how to live according to his word. But in the realms of preferences, uh, in the realms of applications of biblical principles, my way or the highway. That's a, a root of pride. Self-trust is a motivator for control of people. Uh, this goes along with the kind of pride I just described. Um, I believe in me. Proverbs 28, 26 says, he who trusts in himself is a fool. Uh, there's a fundamental flaw with the self-trust motivating control of people. Another motivator is just unbelief, and specifically unbelief in God's goodness, wisdom, power, and timing. If I don't believe God is good, I must take things into my own hands. And I've got to control people to get what I want. If I don't believe God is wise, 
He doesn't know how to do his good purposes, but I do, and so I'm going to arrange all the people the way that I want to get what's good. If I don't believe God's, uh, God's power, God doesn't have the strength or the resources like I have right here on the ground to get done what needs to get done. I'm going to trust myself. Or maybe I don't believe in God's timing. The psalm writer said, no good thing does God withhold from those who walk uprightly. I don't have what I want. Um, maybe a good thing is not good for you to have right now. Oh, I don't want to wait on the Lord. I don't want to trust God's timing. I, I know what's right and I need it now. So if I can use people to get what I want, I'll do it. Another motivator for a control of people is a temporal perspective. Philippians 3.19 describes those who live according to temporary realities rather than seeing their citizenship as in heaven. In other words, they, they have a carpe diem, a sort of seize the day, get it now, get it while it's good, live for now. For me to live is me. That temporal perspective, Paul describes in Philippians 3.19, is they are serving their own appetites. They are slaves of that which they crave. And so that can motivate the control of people. Um, the opposite of that we'll get to later is a, a right eternal perspective lets you say, my citizenship is in heaven, rewards are in heaven, outcomes are in God's hands. Um, I don't need to coerce people to get what I want here. Let's talk about some sinful strategies for controlling people. Just This really is to prime the pump for us, and, and I don't have a list on the screen. It won't all fit, and this list is not exhaustive. We're, we're just going to get our minds thinking about some of the ways that we can have a tendency to try to control people. One is just manipulation. What can I say to get people to do what I want? That, that's different than here are facts, here are biblical principles, I'm praying for you, express my desires, ask, uh, make requests. But none of those things are going to accomplish what I want, and I really need that person to do what I want that person to do. So sinful manipulation tactics rather than biblical communication principles. One of those is a passive-aggressive communication. Uh, that, that may be a, a term borrowed from the world. Do you understand what that passive-aggressive thing is? It's, it's, the, it's the veneer of humility, quietness, love of people, politeness, with the underlying jab of criticism with plausible deniability. So, I really want to drive a point home, but I don't want credit for having done it. I want to criticize you and lay you low and cut you in half, but I don't want to be quoted. And so, through jokes, sarcasm, ambiguous statements, confusion, saying two things at the same time, being double-tongued, are all ways to get what you want out of somebody. And, and maybe what you want is just to make them lower than you. But to do so in a way that nobody could ever blame you for it. That is the opposite of a biblical communication principle that just says, here's what I think, I'm going to be transparent and clear and communicate with you and assume the best in your communication with me. It is a manipulative communication tactic to control people. Another one is physical intimidation. Physical intimidation uh, can come with the threat of physicality, posturing, broadened shoulders, clenched fists, violence, a stern look that says, boy, if you... And it can come with physical violence. A shoving match in a marriage relationship. A knife pulled out of the drawer. A gun unholstered. A slap to the face. That list may seem far-fetched. That list is in the church. That list is in the counseling room for me personally. 
the threat of physical violence or the acting out of physical violence is a control strategy. Another is emotional intimidation. Uh, this just comes out in, in the sort of flying off the handle on one end or an inconsolable sorrow on the other hand as a tactic to control people. You can use intellectual intimidation. I need to remind you with a bunch of facts and figures and charts over here and lists of things I've read and, and hoity-toity people I've interacted with that I'm smarter than you and I'll be the one being listened to right now. Remember? Remember how dumb you are compared to me. And there's a thousand ways to say that. That is a control tactic. Another control tactic is nagging. This might be from the one who feels intellectually or physically inferior, but can be like a dripping faucet. Just a, a perpetual nagging pressure of saying the same things in different ways over and over again to try to get somebody to do what you're doing rather than biblical communication principles. Dominating a conversation is another control tactic. I'm going to fill up the airwaves with my words. I'm not going to listen. And even while you're talking to me, I'm actually just formulating what I'm going to say next in my argument. In fact, a controller sees conversations as a win-lose. I have to win in the conversation, which brings in a whole host of sins in company. If the goal is I must win in the conversation, because if I can't convince you and win in the conversation, I've lost. That's a matter of my identity, my standing, my purpose, my ability to control you. So if winning is the deal, what will I do to win? Well, boy, you open the door to all kinds of sins there. Shade the truth, lie, exaggeration, bombast, uh, Again, more fear, intimidation tactics. All of those come in to, I will win the chess game of this conversation so as to be in control. Another tactic is using information to strong arm or coerce behavior or conformity. Uh, that is, I've got dirt on you. I know what you did back then. I remember these things. I'm keeping a catalog of sins. Uh, contrary to 1 Corinthians 13, love doesn't do that. But I've got this info and I can use it against you. Using communication tactics designed to confuse that put the other person in a position of doubt and second guessing. Well, that was a lot of words. I don't even know what's going on here. I, I must not know. I, th he, they must be right. Rewriting history, using confusing argumentation, long and finely crafted monologues. And you're thinking right now, Smith, aren't you using a long and finely crafted monologue? The above list... We, we would probably attribute to the, the type A or the domineering personality, the vocal person in a relationship. But the quiet type can also control people by silence. In the conversation, take your ball and go home. Um, not going to have any part. I can use my silence to tell you and tell you that I don't want to be a part of what you're doing and make you stop. Bribery. The checkbook can be used. Favors can be used. Cleaning the dishes can be used. Really, anything can be traded as a manipulation tactic to gain control, often by the silent partner. Using victimhood with the aim of evoking sympathy uh, this, is, this can be a strategy for control. Listen, it, it, if you're being addressed with a blind spot, one way out of a blind spot that we sinful humans can use is, oh, you're just piling on. I just can't take it anymore. Oh, woe is me. And then, oh, I, guess I, I guess we can't talk about that thing. It's a control tactic can be. Unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, that is you, you hold kindness hostage. 
as control. You're not giving me what I want, so I refuse for you to have joy in this relationship from me. Withdrawal, removing yourself entirely from a relationship. Many who seek control in a relationship and can't get it will escape. Fantasy in a marital context, infidelities, entertainments, um, things just to avoid the reality that I can't make things the way I want because people are resisting me. Let's move to control of circumstance. Control of circumstance. And it's not always that one person fits into one category or the other. Uh, We separate these out for the the point of sort of dissecting tendencies. Uh, But we can go back and forth between these two categories. I'll describe the control of circumstance this way. It is a manifestation of unbelief, self-love, and pride. So same sort of roots we talked about before. In which I utilize mental strategies and people-pleasing to be comfortable. It's not that I want the, the world ordered just the way I wanted people to conform. It's rather I'm willing to conform to people in order to be comfortable. And what's sought after here is not the comfort of, of all the Lego buildings just like I want them. But the comfort of no problems Positivity, good vibes. Some motivators for control of circumstances are fear. Fear particularly of not being in control. I I don't know what's going to happen. If I speak the truth in a challenging conversation and so... Fear of the unknown, fear of the consequences, uh, fear of a bad reaction means I'm not going to say something difficult. I'm going to keep the peace because I fear the outcome. I'm willing to refrain from doing what's right in order to control my circumstances to get the outcomes. And sometimes that manifests itself in submitting to somebody who is a controller of people. We'll talk about marriage relationships in in a few moments. Another motivator for control of circumstances is a fear of failure. I I just don't want things to go wrong. I I, I don't want to fail. I I don't want to displease somebody. Anxiety, fear of the future motivates control of circumstances. A lot of this boils down to a sort of self-protection This takes us back to the the fundamental failure of faith and theology at the heart of controlling, which is the idolatry of self. I'm worshiping me rather than God. I'm at the center. I get the glory. I'm in control. Um, How do I control my outcomes so that my life is comfortable, happy, safe? Fear of man is a motivator here. What others think about me becomes really important. Conforming my behavior to other people's expectations becomes a means of control of outcomes for me. Again, the idolatry at stake is a comfortable, easy life. Something not promised by God to the Christian, except in the eternal state, uh, far beyond what we could imagine. A motivator for control of circumstances is pride. Again, back to Romans 12.3. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. There are outcomes I want. I think they're better. I know better than God. And I know how to get them. Just please people. Smooth things out. Be a peacemaker, not in a biblical peacemaking way that's blessed according to Jesus in Matthew 5. But being an artificial peacemaker. The kind of unity without truth, the kind of unity without love, the can't we all just get along when there are problems that have to be addressed, sins that have to be forsaken. The motivator of self-trust is in here too. Just a reminder, Proverbs 28, 26, you trust in yourself, you're a fool. That's the, that's the Bible's assessment. And, and we'll have an equipping hour in a couple of weeks on the topic of self-trust. We'll get to that one. Unbelief, again, is a motivator. If I am a practical atheist, 
related to God's goodness, His wisdom, His power, or His timing, I might become a controller of circumstances. God's not good. His plan's not good. I got to take it into my own hands. God's not wise. He doesn't know how to get to His good plan. God's not powerful. He doesn't have the resources, so I need my own. Or God's timing is off. I need it now. And all of this is a failure of faith. Paul says in Galatians 1.10, If I were trying to please men, I would not be a slave of Christ. Do you see the mutually exclusive principles here? Man-pleasing and God-pleasing are diametrically opposed. Now the... The, the controller can err in, in one of two ways. The controller can say, I fear no man because I fear God and fail at being considerate. Fail at love of others. And, and make it sound noble and just and Lutherian. Lutherian. Um, one man against the world. You can have sort of a Luther complex that I don't care what people think about me. I care what God thinks about me, except the, the, the hitch in the equation is what's in my mind is the way I want things to be done. So I give no consideration to others who have another opinion. But the other way the controller fails here is a fear of man. Maybe under the banner of, I want to be considerate. Uh, I, want, I want everybody to be happy. I want to please people. And, and the controller who falls into this trap doesn't address sin where it needs to be addressed. Doesn't address problems where they need to be addressed. And fails at love. But does so under the banner of love and consideration and humility. And then the motivator for this underlying it is, is still that temporal perspective we talked about from Philippians 3. The heart sets its sights on temporal things rather than our citizen, citizenship being in heaven. I have appetites for things that are passing away. How can I control this outcome right now for next week, next month, in this life if I need to please people to get what I want, that's what I'm going to do because what I want is what I want. That's different than just faithful obedience to the Lord and trust Him with outcomes. And wait till the end. He'll make all things right. <clears throat> Let's talk about some sinful strategies for controlling circumstances. I've hinted at these already, but under the banner of, of pleasing people... A strategy would be to get peace, eliminate conflict, don't address problems, wear rose-colored glasses, optimism over anything because pessimism is bad, anything negative must be uh, shooed away. And so that the, the strategy means avoid suffering, or when it's there, ignore it, rename it, call it something else, just say everything's fine. Okay, that's, that's not the biblical perspective of 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 that says our light and momentary troubles, afflictions, produce for us an eternal weight of glory. That's having real affliction. Read Paul's afflictions in 2 Corinthians 11. They're real and heavy and weighty, but seeing them as light in, and temporal in view of the eternal perspective. Put them on the scale of eternity. The, the weightiness of glory and the eternality of our citizenship in heaven makes real affliction light momentary. That's a, that's a biblical perspective. The, the controller of circumstances just wants to write things off. You're not putting it through the grid of a biblical perspective and an eternal eyesight. Uh, you're just waving things off like it's no big deal. And, and there are times when things need to be addressed. A sinful strategy for controlling circumstances is just don't upset anybody. Don't upset the apple cart. Don't rock the boat. And so escape strategies take place. Escape to entertainment. Um, think happy thoughts. Positive vibes only. Avoid the kind of people <clears throat> that bring about rejection, discomfort, conflict, and emotional hurt. Don't enter into relationships. 
Bitten once, twice shy. Uh, I'll never love again. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go back to the church. Last time I was at the church, people hurt me. I'm just gonna do my own thing. That is a control strategy for somebody who wants the circumstances to be different, and it is unbiblical. Another strategy we might just call enablement. It really is a result of the strategies where you enable people to sin. Listen, someone is in a self-destructive behavior or a behavior that harms other people, and we just say, I don't know, I don't want to cause problems. So it goes unaddressed. And what are the consequences for the self-destructive or for the guy with a, a belt full of grenades walking into a crowded pizza joint? Uh, there's a time to step in and help, and, and, and the controller of circumstances suffers from his idolatries in cowardice with the results that people suffer. It's not love. The, the sinful strategy of the one controlling circumstances is unwilling to tell people no. The effects of this in parenting the effects of this in discipleship, counseling relationships, the, the effects of this with friends are long-lasting. Let's talk now for control, about control in marriage relationships. This is, this is where things get tougher because a, a marriage relationship is tighter, closer, and more enduring than the other relationships you have. Stakes are higher. And often the, the temptations to control are, are closer and tighter. Often in a marriage, there is a crisis, a, a stalemate, a divorce, infidelity. And that happens long before the roots of the problem are even identified. There was an earlier generation when divorce was a social stigma where people stayed married and miserable. They weren't operating in a biblical marriage. They weren't glorifying God. They weren't exercising self-emptying love. And they weren't having any fun. But they stayed in it because you had to. Well, there's no more stigma. Um, it, divorce is nearly celebrated, encouraged, made easy. In fact, uh, fewer people are getting married. Uh, more people are remaining single than even getting married. And that includes remarriages. In our day. So, in a marriage, if two people are in a battle for control, or even if only one party exercises sinful control, there will be trouble. A marriage is to be two people becoming one for the glory of God, in self emptying love, for the benefit of the other, functioning according to their God designed roles, portraying the gospel to a watching world, serving one another as the husband leads and the wife follows. But sinful control operating in a marriage relationship sees the marriage partner as a means or an obstacle to my personal comfort or a means or an obstacle to help me get what I want. And when they fail at my purposes for their existence... I resort to strategies of control to make them conform to my idolatries. Deal-making, comparisons, compromises of biblical principles. We get into the mindset of, of give and take rather than give and give and give and give and give. The result is anger, bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness. Eventually, one party resents the control of the other and will act out. And then you see bizarre behavior Violence, infidelity, withdrawal, or the dissolution of the marriage. And then a new relationship is pursued with the internal problems totally unaddressed. And oftentimes, a reactionary response in the new relationship. I was controlled by a people controller, so I'm going to marry someone I can control. Or, I couldn't stand being married to a people pleaser. I'm going to pursue someone strong. You haven't solved the problems. You've changed the environment and you've got the same heart. I had a friend years ago with a, a Volkswagen bug and they require things like motor oil. And they were driving over the mountains of Southern California. Actually didn't know you had to put oil in the car. 
And Nick just grimaced. You know what happened. Uh, oil had been out of the vehicle for a while, hot engine running, metal parts melt and fuse together. Now you have a nicely welded block of metal that's not going to get a car anywhere. The engine completely seized up. Man, I need a new car. Take that seized up block of air-cooled aluminum, really beautiful machinery that, that is now totally worthless, and, and put it in a, a brand new 1974 Volkswagen Beetle shell. You see the problem, you, you've taken a, a broken engine that will never work, and you don't fix the problem by putting it in a new car. Here's the, here's the difficulty with the church. And I, I am just admitting to you uh, a crippling reality that I, I, I'm not sure what the solution is. Most often the church finds itself addressing the outward, the, the outburst, the bizarre behavior, or the infidelity, or the person who says, I'm out of this marriage. And the church should the church must address those things. But the church fails, and, and often we, we, we've used church discipline to address those things appropriately. But oftentimes the church fails to address the controlling partner that for decades exercised unbiblical and unloving marriage practices that went under the radar, they were cloaked, they were disguised, maybe they were there and nobody pointed it out, nobody saw it, nobody loved enough to jump in. And could you blame the woman under a controlling man after 20 years? Where she's never had access to her bank accounts, never allowed to make a decision, made fun of in public, treated like a child at the grocery store, who was intellectually browbeaten into submission at every conversation. If one day she says, I don't like this, and nobody helped me. And I just portrayed a picture with the guy as the controller, the wife as the victim. It goes both ways. And the church misses the domineering or the manipulative sins over decades so easily. And I'm not sure what the solution is, except that we need to be in each other's lives and care for one another. If you're a husband and you have a stranglehold on decision-making, finances, input, budget, checkbook, find yourself dominating in conversations, coercing public behavior, treating your wife like a child, or if you're a wife treating your husband like a child, you, you know you're smarter than him and you let him know whenever you can. You, you complain that he doesn't lead in the relationship and then you complain when he does. There are so many manifest, manifestations of this. Withholding intimacy or using intimacy as a bribe or a bargaining chip. Withholding joy and humor in the relationship as punishment. Or using punishment and reward strategies for manipulating outcomes. These things all have to go away. They have to be put to death. If you're married and you have as an idol peace and comfort and safety and so you avoid conflict. You're a people pleaser. And you refrain from addressing problems or sins, not because you're willing to overlook in love, but because you don't want problems. That's not glorifying to God. That's not good for your marriage. So oftentimes in a marriage, you have one that wants to control circumstances and the one that wants to control people, and they often go together and it works out for a while. Coincidentally, often they're attracted to each other. Ultimately, all of this is, uh, if it's, there's a battle for control, it is a fight with God. This is a fight of theology. It is a fight of faith. If you're in a marriage and you find yourself characterized by controlling tactics, let me suggest to you that a Christian is not a slave of those things. And you might have fundamental questions to ask of your own heart. If you find yourself battling these tendencies, praise God. See them. We'll talk about some hope and remedies in a moment. And it's okay to have others looking into your life, asking for help. 
If you're in a marriage and you perceive that you are being controlled in sinful ways, you will have to trust the Lord. And your citizenship is in heaven. And there's hope. And there's help. I know we're scratching the surface of a big topic. I may have raised more questions than answered. I want to close our time with some hope and some remedies. Again, these are big picture categories. The hope for a Christian, uh, let me start with hope. If you realize uh, I'm not a Christian and this is how I live. I thought it was normal. Um, Your hope is in Christ. There's a different way to live. There's a better way to live. Um, There's joy in self-emptying love that you know not of. And let me just invite you to it through Christ. If you're a Christian and you're recognizing tendencies here, let me just remind you what's true. You are not a slave to sin. You have a new identity in Christ. You have a new future. You have the Holy Spirit indwelling. You're a new creature. You have power. You have Christ's model of humble servant leadership of selfless love, of self-emptying concern for others, and a total trust in the sovereignty of his Father. You have the Scriptures. Maybe this conversation this morning is a window into reading some familiar passages through a new lens. And you have the church. And you have shepherds, elders, pastors, small group leaders, friends, disciplers, ministry leaders in this church to help. Let's talk through categories of remedies. I think, do I have these on the screen? Recognition, is that one up there? Okay, number one, recognition. Um, I don't remember if it was G.I. Joe or something, but knowing is half the battle. That comes from somewhere. (laughs) Quote somebody with authority. I don't know who it was. Knowing's half the battle. It's not the battle. If you're recognizing tendencies in your heart, Don't walk out of this room and go, good to get that off my chest by listening. (laughs) You haven't begun. Recognition is not the same thing as confession. Confession is not the same thing as repentance. But it starts with a recognition. Secondly, confession. Confession is agreeing with God, agreeing with others. God, you saw my heart. You you tweaked me with the word. (sighs) You're right. In fact, you're writer than I even know to admit. This probably goes way deeper than I think it does. What's next? Next week's equipping hour um, will be part one of a topic called repentance. And I want to give you next week a a template for repentance where we'll walk through some of these things. Uh, The following week, we'll look at um, the, the characterization of repentance from 2 Corinthians 7. But we'll talk more about repentance next week, Lord willing. Fourth on the list is replacement. Listen, it, it's, it's not enough to, to know that there's a problem, to agree with God that there's a problem, and then to resolve to turn from that problem. We actually have to do some, some work. We, we have to do some replacement in our thinking and our behavior. We have to think through, what am I thinking wrong that's motivating these idolatries That's producing this behavior. What am I thinking wrong about God and about myself and about others? Maybe about my spouse or my siblings. Maybe about my boss or my employees. We got some work to do up here. Rethinking things. And and then we've got to do some replacement at the behavior level. What activities am I doing that are displeasing to the Lord? How do they need to change? What do I need to put to death? Let's think about reframing our thinking for a moment. There's a theology here. God is sovereign. He's good. He has a purpose and his plan. This is a practical application of the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. A second area of rethinking is how we think about ourself. How we think about ourself. If you're a Christian, there is a security in your identity that cannot be touched by your circumstances. Do you know that? There is a security in your identity that cannot be touched by your circumstances. So let go. Stop trying to control your circumstances. You have a standing with God, a destiny in heaven 
that's really critical. And that's all on the positive side. The negative side of thinking rightly about yourself is you're not as smart as you think you are. Your wisdom is finite. Your, your knowledge base is minuscule. And, and if you think, oh, he doesn't know me. I'm a lot smarter than you think he is. I just mean count the number of facts there are. And count the number of facts that you know and haven't forgotten and actually assess correctly. I'll just give you one fact. I don't know the answer. It's a, it's a question. How many scales were on all the fish in the Mediterranean Sea on January 2nd, 1784? That's a fact, a knowable fact and a finite number and God knows it and nobody else does. Multiply that by a, a trillion imaginary things that we could think of that are real facts. And, and you realize quickly, we know nothing. Just get there in your mind. You're also limited in your skill. Your ability to take what you know and apply it, especially when it comes to other moral agents, people who have responsibilities before the Lord to obey him with what they know. Remember the taint of the mixed condition. You are in a war internally. Don't trust yourself. Give others the benefit of the doubt. Don't give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Recognize you're worse than you think you are. Um, don't worry. There's another equipping hour coming on people who suffer under, I think I'm worse than I am. We'll get there. We'll help you. I hope. <laughs> Just recognize, I don't have the wisdom, goodness, and skill to be in charge of the universe as a central planner, nor to be in charge of someone else's life as his central planner. Romans 14. I haven't opened my Bible yet. I've been quoting things. Let me just have you open your Bible and look at this one. This relates to other people in the area of control and assessment. I just want you to see this. In Romans 14, 3. Paul here is talking about preference issues. Um, people apply biblical principles in different ways in the Christian life. And we live together. How do we love one another? He says, the one who eats must not view the one who does not eat with contempt. And the one who does not eat must not judge the one who eats. For God accepted him. And then verse 4, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls. Uh, that's a critical principle for us to think about whose servant another human being is ultimately. And remember Romans 5, God has shed out, shed out his love abroad in our hearts so that we stand in grace. Romans 8, we stand in adoption. Colossians 3, 1 to 3, our life is hid with Christ. And when he appears, your real life will be seen for what it really is. All of those identity things are just critical. You got to have an eternal perspective. I just refer to you to 2 Corinthians 4 and 5. Read it. Think about eternity. It fixes a lot of stuff. <laughs> what do you need to do behavior-wise? Pray. Pray all the time. Pray about everything. Pray with thanksgiving. Don't stop praying. And then you need to live out selfless and sacrificial love with an eternal perspective. Listen to 1 Peter 4, 7 and 8. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love one another deeply. What does that look like? Love covers a multitude of sins. Don't have to control everybody else's behavior. Trust the Lord. Look forward to eternity. Read Psalm 37 and get a theology of waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord is simply trusting him. Next moment. Trust multiplied by time. Trusting him tomorrow and the next day and the next day. I put some resources for you up on the screen um, that I think are helpful. I hope. Did I put those up there? They didn't make it. Okay, sorry. I'll, I'll read them out to you. The, some of these have been um, uh, recommended reading in the past. 
But Ed Welch's book is titled, When People Are Big and God is Small. One of those books every Christian must read. Somebody asked me this week, how many books are on your top 10 book list? (laughs) I had to confess probably 111. Um, But this one, it's really up there somewhere. The, The subtitle is Overcoming Peer Pressure, Codependency, and the Fear of Man. I hope that's an attractive title that makes you buy it and read it. Uh, And then Jerry Bridges classic, Trusting God Even When Life Hurts. And the third resource for you is Tom Angstead. Let's pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning for dissecting things in us that we need dissecting. We thank you for the help of your word, the hope of the gospel, the, the vulnerability we have with one another to say, hey, this is me, this is real, uh, can you help me grow? And, and even as our, our beloved friend and disciple, Tom Angstead, has said many times, he is just a beggar helping other beggars find the bread. We pray that we likewise would be humble servants of one another, seeking to grow together in your son. We ask it in his name. Amen.